Good. Thanks for being here. This is the last session. The only thing that is dividing you from whatever. <laughs> we have two hours uh, after the session, so we, we probably have the opportunity, uh, if, if you like, to uh, go into some of the questions uh, which, which may come up after the, after the talk. Uh, but I want to say you're invited because we have both a talk and an, an uh, exhibition for the same topic. So if, if you like, just after the talk, because there's no other session after that, uh, come to my exhibition and I will show you some things hands on. So um, what we're talking about in this last session, um, I hope it's a little bit entertainment for you. Um, it's a bit technical. Uh, hopefully there's something in for everybody. We're talking about the time uh, from 1975 up to around 1980. Uh, one question up front, has anybody been in the talk uh, in, in the late uh, morning session where it was about computer history before the home computer? Hands up, anyone was, or okay, okay. There will be some overlaps <laughs> with this, uh, but I try to, to get a bit across that, what you have already heard in, in, the, in the previous session, but you will some, have some, some doubles uh, probably for that. I uh, apologize for that. So, let's start with this. We're talking about Altair, Imsi, Dazzler, and CPM. But in fact, CPM and the Altair and Imsi are just things around. I want to talk about the Dazzler. Why about the Dazzler? Because the Dazzler was the very, very first graphics card, the graphics hardware that was affordable for hobbyists, of, for individuals. There have been some uh, graphic solutions before, I will show some of them, for the business use, with lots of money. But for those who, who wanted to use it for, for hobby or for personal things, uh, it, it, there was a general, uh, general rule. Uh, it had to be less expensive than a car. So if that was afford this was affordable by, by, for the hobbyists, and uh, so they did not buy a second car, did not buy a single car, whatever, and they gave all their money for, for a hobby. And this was the, the, were the target, uh, this, what was addressed uh, with, with, with the Dazzler board. But um, um, I want to show a bit around what, what, what was actually happened. And uh, I want to start with some some event that happened in early 1976. I, I'm not completely sure which exact date that was, but it was early. And what happened was uh, New, New York, who, who have been in New York already? Uh, some, some of you. Um, the Fifth Avenue, corner 32nd Street. There happened something. And what happened was a traffic jam. And actually, this talk is about the traffic jam. What was the cause of that traffic jam at that day? And the traffic jam, it happened. Interesting thing was there was a model shop, model in terms of aircraft model or small car model or something, for, for hobbyists create, creating models uh, that can fly, that can drive, whatever. And there was a, a, a shop in the shop which which dealt about computers. It was a computer shop. Uh, this alone was something that you can talk about because there have been not very many computer shops at that time in the US. And of course, there had to be one in, the, in New York, and it was a single, the single computer shop in New York. And they had something that caused that traffic jam. And I will talk a little bit later about what exactly that was. But, um, Back to the year 1971, so one, be one year before. Um, when we had a look around the computer scene uh, and the use of computer, it was uh, predominantly dominated by, by the dinos, I call them, the, the large computers that filled complete rooms, like the computers for, from IBM. Uh, they were 
extremely expensive, like, like this one, uh, the, the IBM S370. I think it started about two, 200, no, two million, two million dollars in, in the base configuration. And, uh, uh, but, and the only customers were, were large banks and such who had uh, some, some use cases for that and, and could afford the money. And this was the, 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 do pre the dominant part of, of the whole computer business at the times. Uh, but there have been also the so-called minis, like this one. We have some in the exhibitions here. Uh, I would highly recommend to, to have a look at the PDPs, for example, from digital equipment. Some of them you can see live over here. Uh, this is an example from, from uh, digital equipment for, for the PDP. The PDP-11 is one of the most uh, sold uh, uh, mini computers of the time, and I can remember my my own school had my own gymnasium, my high school had a, uh, it had a CPM pad, and uh, the other school had a PDP 11, and it was this was a completely different class, and uh, I, I was a bit well. But we don't want to talk about minis and don't want to talk about dinos. We want to talk about what the hobbyists uh, was interested in. And uh, there was one, one thing that happened in 1971, and that was the, the dawn of the microprocessor in terms of not having that large case with all that just to implement a CPU, like you see outside, but it was on a single chip. And it needed the idea to do exactly that, which was done by Intel at that time in 1971. And the first product they brought out was the uh, 4004 processor. It was a 4-bit processor with 16 legs. 16 legs is, uh, was using TTL components, for example. 16 legs is not, not the, the largest one. So they fit into a 16-leg socket, yeah? And it did, could not do very much. It was like a, not really a microprocessor, but more, more like a microcontroller. Uh, okay, but uh, Intel got an, an in extremely interesting response on that and uh, decided to go to the next step, uh, which was the Intel 8008, uh, which was an 8-bit uh, processor. And, uh, uh, but they didn't stop at this. It was more or less some kind of proof of concept for, for an 8-bit microprocessor. And the reprocessor that came out was in 1974, so two years later. And this was the one, this was a bang. It was the Intel uh, 8080. And the Intel 8080 had an instruction set, which is still dominant in the PC world, because it was one of the predecessors of the 8086. Yeah? So 8086 had this very similar um, uh, instruction set, but already at 16-bit. Yeah, this was an 8-bit uh, uh, variant of, of the so, some some kind of 8-bit 8 variant of the of the 8086. So this had already 40 legs. This was an explosion in terms of number of, of legs, and you needed a special socket for that to, to bring it in. But but the most interesting thing, thing was the price. It was about $300 at that time, and uh, this was. Uh, already affordable for, for obvious, so could uh, deal with that. But uh, later came, of, of course, uh, making it better. Uh, everyone who knows the Intel 8080 also knows the clone. No, clone is not the right word because it was an improvement uh, against the 8080, which was called uh, Z or Z80. It came from another company called Zlog, who was founded by exactly the person who did the development at Intel, for the 8080. Yeah? This was not completely uncommon at that time uh, because those who, who had the knowledge and, and did the, all the developments uh, sometimes felt a, a bit limited by the company where, where they, they are working in. And they, you know, in the US, the first thing that you do if you, f if you feel limited, you simply uh, start your own company. And, and this was, was done very often at that time. And the one who, who was uh, responsible in charge for, for the development of the 8080, then uh, founded C-Log uh, 
And uh, this the first product, the single product for a long time, was the ZS80, which had double uh, the CPU frequency uh, than the, uh, the, the Intel 8080, and had a couple of very interesting uh, additional instructions. One drawback is software that was developed for the ZS80 normally didn't run on the Intel 8080, but this is uh, a different thing. Okay, so why was this important? I already gave some hint. It's all about cost. So you didn't have to buy a mini, you could buy a microprocessor, microprocessor. And you could use this microprocessor to create very interesting solutions. And one example is a scale B. Who knows the scale B? No one of you? It was the first, as far as I know, the first uh, real computer design from the hobbyist area, which used the, the 8080 as, as a single processor. And you see already a couple of, of things uh, which became very, very common for, for later uh, designs. You had, for example, here uh, some kind of, of bus system with uh, uh, slots, and you could put in cards in that to, to make some extensions for it. And uh, you have also so these control buttons here in, in, in the front panel uh, to, to do some control, but you can, could not do very much with this. And uh, uh, it, it, it was also very limited. It was actually more or less a, a proof of concept that, that to, how to build around some kind of computer around the Intel 8080 processor. This was in 1974, and uh, there was one, one guy, Ed Roberts, uh, who said, okay, I have to do to create something that looks a bit like a mini, also from the size, like a mini computer, uh, but should have the Intel 8080 inside and should provide everything to utilize the 8080 for a real computer, whatever that is. Uh, so uh, this is how it looks like. I probably have heard Sean in, in the previous talk about the Altair. So this was the na name of that, Altair, who, who is it's common with, with, with the stars and the sky probably knows that Altair is also the name of a very one of the top, I think, ten uh, brightest stars uh, in, 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 the, in, the sky, in the sky. So um, the Altair was then uh, a computer that had um, some more things that improved the, the design of the scale uh, And one of those who interested sich ver very much in the Altair was, was a guy called Bill Gates. Uh, and he already at that time started at, at, uh, at a university at Harvard, as far as I know, and uh, he saw that and he ordered one of the first ones for, for his own development. Okay, and then we have something that is also shown outside in, 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 in our exhibition over there, which is the IMSI. Uh, the IMSI, again, was some kind of clone of the Altair. It came out, I think, about six, seven, eight, nine, nine months after, after the Altair, uh, because those who have ordered the Altair they had discovered a, a couple of limitations or things that was, was, was a bit nagging. So, so the, for example, the, uh, the power supply unit didn't uh, bring all the power that was required uh, to, um, to, to, to supply all the boards that you could put in. And, and a couple of other things were a bit complex. But I think the most important thing is the IMSI 8080 looks much better. Uh, than, than the Altair, because it looks like a mini and has all those uh, uh, buttons and keys and, and th blinking things and so on. And, and you can see it outside how it works, and, and I love it. But I love it also because it was some kind of film star, because it had an appearance uh, in a movie called uh, War Games. Uh, like, see it here over there. Uh, who of you have seen the movie? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I don't have to talk very much about that, but it, it didn't have really a function in, in that movie. It was just a fake computer that wasn't even connected to the terminal, uh, which was used uh, in, in, in that movie. And they had just one single program running on that thing, and the only, uh, the only uh, thing that the program should do was to switch those LEDs, those uh, bulbs on and on, on and off, so that it looks a bit like a computer, or how, how a computer should look like, is blinking, blinking things. Anyway, 
Um, I will go back to that in sh later, but uh, there is also another computer which looks a bit more like, like the computers later, like the home computers, because it had already an integrated keyboard. Yeah? But inside, it was still the same as, as it was with, with the IMSI and, and the Altair. It's just that because of the limited space, you could not put so many boards inside. Yeah? But the Sol was a very interesting computer that it sold quite well at that time. And it was just because another computer, um, which I tell later um, a bit about that. So, but we wanted to talk actually a bit, not so much about the computers, we want to talk about the Dazzler. The Dazzler is a graphics board, a graphics solution. So I want to talk about graphics, and graphics is video. And uh, uh, if you have a computer like this, you still have no display. Yeah, you have a keyboard, but no display. So how was it if you were using a computer like this, which even does not have a keyboard. Yeah, it's just a CPU with some, some uh, uh, memory about that. And the normal solution at that time was, of course, the teletype. Yeah, because teletypes were already in use. You needed two teletypes, one on the sending point, one on the receiving point. Could connect them over thousands of, of miles and uh, could type in at one, and it came out on, on the printer of the other side, and vice versa. So that you could just send uh, something like text uh, across uh, uh, very long distances. And those had uh, uh, interfaces, connections, which you could connect to a computer like the IMSI and, and the ITR. So they had the keyboard, and you had the printer. And most of the, the, the Taylor types also had a, a, a paper tape, punch, or reader. Some, most had both, because sometimes you had to, to record what is coming in and not to print it, to record it, or, or to some already had some kind of processing capability, so you could, could read in certain configurations uh, for, for the teletype. And this was used, uh, and they looked like this one. This is a typical paper tape. And uh, you see that there is also writing on that. This basic 1.0. Has anybody an idea what kind of tape, paper tape this might be? Microsoft Thanks. Yeah, great. Wanted to say the same thing. thing. Yeah, perfectly right. And uh, the guy who, who, who made this, uh, this is from a video that was, uh, was taken in, in the 90s, 1990s, was Bill Gates. And uh, as I already said, Bill Gates was, was one of the, the first customers of the Altair computers, and he con tried to contact it, uh, the company who, which produced the Altair and said, I can do basic for you. And they said, how oh, can we, we make sure that you're serious? We, we, we are getting thousands of that calls a day. Uh, and he at some time was convinced that, that he wanted to buy the, the Altair anyway, and he wanted to do all the basic anyway to port it uh, or to create it for, for the Altair. Basic was pretty new at that time as a, as a uh, computing language. And uh, what you can see here is an Altair, of course, and you can see a terminal for those, and this is something special for its own. You can see this kind of terminal at least two times in the exhibition. This is a Lear Siegler ADM 3A, and uh, it's one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen in, in, in the computing history because the design is so appealing and convincing, and it, it, it's, it has been merchandised as, as dump terminal, which means, well, dump. And it was dump because it couldn't do much. It had a, just could type in and you could show, display something. But if you're familiar with Unix or Linux, uh, the term cat had just two entries, one to position the cursor in the horizontal and one to position the cursor in the vertical area, and this is all you could do. Uh, with, with, with it, but you can connect it uh, to one of those computers and had some additional means to, uh, to input and output uh, the, the, the data uh, you, you, want to talk, you want to work with. And if you have a, a, a very close look, you see what he has in his hands. Yeah, this is again paper tape. Uh, paper tape. Paper tape has some advantages. It actually loses the information 
I don't know how many million years <laughs> you, you can take it, but there's some advantages in, in comparison to, to the media we have today. Okay, here's the Lee Ziegler again as, as one example of the video terminals, because ver video terminals, of course, were, were a very good alternative uh, to the, to the uh, teletype. So you, you could just uh, switch off uh, the teletype and, and disconnect it from, from the Altair or the IMSI or, or the SOL and connect some kind of terminal like this, which was as expensive as the, the teletypes, but nicer to use. Um, by the way, uh, whoever knows the, the VI editor of Unix and, or Linux, uh, it was programmed on that Lea Siegler terminal. And uh, Lea, Lea Siegler is, 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 by the way, the same company that's also creating the Learjet, <laughs> the, the aircraft. And uh, uh, when, when you sometimes struggle about uh, why there are certain key combinations in, in the VI, look at the, the keyboard uh, and you, you get a better understanding of that. Uh, with this terminal. We, uh, we have at least two exemplars outside. So, um, but we are in the hobby area. And the a terminal like the Lear Siegler was about $1,000 at that time. And you can imagine how much that was. Uh, it was still not as much as you had to pay for, for a new car, but as you had to pay for, uh, for a used car. And uh, this was a decision. <clears throat> so how to create video possibly a bit cheaper. And, and one of the ideas was, um, so-called typewriter, it could not do much. <clears throat> it was just a circuit, it could just put uh, letters on, on, a, on a video screen and nothing more. It couldn't even connect to, to anything outside. So it was, again, some, some kind of proof of concept. But there was one, one guy <clears throat> who said, okay, I, I want that integrated in my computer, so I have means to show data from the computer directly on a video uh, display. And the guy who, who said that was Steve Wozniak, and he created a solution for that. And uh, the solution you can see here together with Steve Jobs, the two Steves, and what you see here is the Apple One. Because the Apple One <coughs> was the first computer uh, that really integrated the, the video interface on, on the same board. You can see it here, there's, there's, there's a video display uh, which is connected to, to, the, to the Apple One board and again you have a separate, to, to add a separate keyboard to get everything running. And this is how it looks like. This is at my home because I, I did the rebuild of the Apple One a couple of years ago and showed that also in another session. Uh, which you can also still download or, or look at as the CCC streams for, for the story of the Apple one, but uh, to get to, to today we have a different, different topic. But here you can see in the upper left corner, you have the video circuit. Yeah? And, and the connector over there is a connector that provides the video signals, which you can use uh, for, uh, uh, yeah, for connecting uh, a composite uh, video monitor. But we want to talk about graphics. And again, we, I want to go one step behind or before. And, and uh, it's, it's very hard to say what was the, the first graphics hardware, really. I, I think it, it's, it's actually not, not of, of much meaning to, to talk about that. But I just want to show a couple of, of different approaches uh, how to create graphics with, with a computer. And this has been the very, uh, one of the very, very old dinos. And the, uh, it was short after the Second World War, and uh, it was ADSEC. And the ADSEC had a very, very interesting uh, technology inside. This is how it looked like, again, room filling. And uh, it was a component-based computer. And the components looked like this. So they could be drawn out of the system. If they were faulty, it could be repaired and, or analyzed, put, and bug fixed, and could be put in. And it was based on those tubes. And as you might know, those tubes had, had a very limited uh, lifetime. So it was just a matter of statistics that they failed. So they were in, a, in continuous process in, in exchanging those, those things. But I don't want to talk about these kind of tubes, which were working like a transistor, more or less. I want to talk about those kind of tunes, which are a bit in the background. Who knows about that? Mm -hmm. uh, these were one way how we can implement storage. 
yeah, who have been someone who has been in, in, the, in the, the talk yesterday about the history of storage and the overview. No one, okay, one who knows about that. What they did is they used a video tube to create some kind of pattern on that. And after creating that, they knew about the technology when, when the, the electron beam could be again uh, traced across the display and for some magic way, I, I still have not understood how it works, they could see whether on the phosphor already was some, some charge up from, from a previous uh, run of the beam before. So if there was a pattern, this could be reread a couple of microseconds after that again. So it could be refreshed and shown. So this was some kind of RAM they had. And that was a very, very interesting effect. effect. You could see on the first side, on the first glance, what is inside that RAM. Because it was a video tube that was used. So uh, what did the operators, uh, what they ever do? They're doing nonsense. And they created, they played around with creating patterns that made some sense. So this is a typical pattern you, you saw about when, when doing normal business. And they created other things or used it for other things at that time, like, like this. Yeah. Actually, uh, this is a very, very late one. This was not uh, done at that, that time uh, because uh, Space Invaders was not yet, in, not yet invented. Uh, OK, F but this was a kind of, of graphics, actually, and they, they could already use. Uh, another example is one of the very first uh, computer games called uh, Space War. Uh, it was naturally because space had to be in that game and war had to be in that game. So Space War, of course, was one of the first things that, that had been created. It was very, a bit similar like, like uh, asteroids in, in, in how it worked. You could not do very much about that. But you can already see we have some kind of tube where you can create graphics on this. And it was a, this was a PDP-1. I just talked about the PDP-11. So this was some time before. Uh, it was in the year 1962 when they already could uh, use this kind of graphic tubes, uh, graphics to, to create, uh, tubes to create graphics. But they also could do it in an interactive way. A couple of years later, in the year 1963, you see here the sketchpad, where you already have some kind of human interface uh, to interact with it, and you could already point on it as some kind of early mouse, how, how to work with, with, with uh, those graphics. But all those, those graphics at that time were so-called vector graphics, in, in contrast to, to frame buffers or raster graphics. And the pioneers of that, who created the company, or founded the company with, with the highest effect in, in that area, were Evans and Sutherland, uh, who created really capable computers, uh, which were completely based on vector graphics, and looked like, like this checkerboard, for, for example. This was in the year 1969. So we're getting closer to, to the 70s, as you see. Um, and also, there were companies that said, OK, we want to combine that capability to create vector graphics. Vector graphics mean uh, not raster, but you have a, a straight lines across the screen. And because you have some kind of phosphor, which has a very, very long, long lasting glue on, uh, on that, uh, you can create uh, images with, with straight lines, which had no jaggles. Yeah, and, uh, but the, the number of lines were limited at that time uh, because the CPU had to, to control everything. And uh, okay, this is one of the first terminals that had that technology or, or included that technology. This is the Tektronix. I used to work with Tektronix terminals during my study time. It was 4014, I think, uh, something like this, and programmed. I can remember it was a, 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 a vector based image of a space shuttle. Yeah, good. This is how it looked like on, on, on this one. So it was already quite capable in creating graphics, um, but limited in terms of uh, the amount of information that could be, could be uh, shown. But there is another point in time which was really uh, 
a milestone. This was really a milestone. And if you want to ask me what kind of computer artifact, I would give all of my collection in change. Probably it might be a Xerox Alto, because in a Xerox Alto they were created tremendous things. And the interesting thing is that Xerox, you know, it was, was a, a, a copier and, and printer company, and, but they spent some of their money to set up a, a, a group a, 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 of scientists uh, who could just, just make research on, on whatever they wanted. And uh, they used it to create tremendous things. They had uh, unlimited hardware. You can see this is a Nova mini computer over here, which was complete, very, very expensive and used, uh, I think it would, w was also used uh, for, for, for the development of the Ethernet because it was part of the project. And uh, as you can see here, you have those, those hard disks placed on the table, on the desktop. And this is a Nova CPU here, here. And this is the, the drive where the, the, the uh, removable hard disk could be, could be put in. But the, you already see some, I get some idea on there's graphics on the screen, yeah, which you see over there. And if you have a closer look at what, what is shown on the graphics, it looked like this. This was 1973. Yeah? And it looks like Macintosh. Yeah? And it was already there, the mouse to use it. There were already menus. You could do detailed graphics and so on. But this was nothing for the hobbyists. Uh, there, I don't know how many of those have really built. Uh, I think it was a couple of hundreds. But they mostly were used in research uh, uh, institutes. And, uh, but they had already an object-oriented IDE with a language called ADA. And I used to work with, with that ADA language a couple of time ago, and I say, okay, this was really milestone at that time. But we want to talk about uh, the hobbyists. And going back to the roots, I want to put the focus a bit on who was involved in that develop, in development and who worked together. And there were actually especially four groups. There were on one side the publishers, who published the, for example, computer magazines, where they, uh, they could concentrate knowledge and distribute knowledge about that. And they were always very, very happy if, if there's someone who, who is go giving new stories or new uh, developments in, into, for those computer magazines and to try to foster it. There were on the other side the tech company associates. So associates of, for example, Hewlett Packard in, in Palo Alto or uh, associates of other startup companies uh, who were there around in the Silicon Valley and so on. Uh, uh, the, the important thing is they had access to all the technology know-how of the tech companies of, of the time. And there was the, the, the third group were the hobbyists, which, who had probably some time or much time to spend and a lot of enthusiasm, but not much money. And there were the scientists who worked at the research labs, for example, or the Stanford University in, in that area. And all those four in Germany had been completely separated at the time. But it was different in the US, at the West Coast. They worked all together. This was a very interesting thing. And, uh, well, here are some of the the guys who, who really took an important part, I call them the drivers. I will not go in, in detail who is who, but um, almost all of them, if not all, are founders. So they all founded, founded their own company. They not just did their hobby, they not just did their research, they founded their own company, but shared all the knowledge among each other and with the community. At least one of them you should know, there's Steve Wozniak there on the, on the left side. Okay, here's the, the, the area of interest. This is what, what is today called the Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, Silicon Valley was a real hot pot because there were 
companies like Hewlett Packard, which were already founded in the, in the 30s of, the, of that century, but a lot of startups that ca came up, uh, or uh, some who had uh, just an office over there, which Olivetti, for example, is, is an Italian company. And uh, just to, to show some, some of the publications uh, of the time, I just want to point to is one of them is, for example, Popular Electronics. This was, by the way, uh, the first uh, publication where, where the Altair, which is uh, shown here on, on, that, on that cover, uh, was published. And this was exactly the, the ish, issue that, that Bill Gates found and uh, which, which showed him, okay, I want to have some of them uh, to, to start with my business. But there was also Interface Age and, of course, Byte uh, and the German Chip magazine. <laughs> uh, who knows about that? And a couple of others of maybe a bit less importance. Um, if you talk about the time, and especially the hobbyist space, was, was the technology, for example, of the IMSI. And when you have a look at the different components, everything is very, very common to what you have today. They had already a microprocessor, a CPU for that. They had a graphics controller, if you could afford one uh, at that time. They had sometimes a floppy controller, if you could afford the mass storage for it, which was normally, if, if you were happy, uh, normally it was uh, just, just a tape recorder, uh, a cassette tape recorder. But if you were happy, you had a, a floppy disk, which was much, much, much more expensive. That some RAM uh, started at 4K, 8K, something like this, and you had an address space of about 64 uh, k kilobytes, and well, you had some some means to connect uh, some kind of serial device, like a video or, or a, a teletype or that, and you of course needed some some power to to drive the system, the PSU. So nothing really surprising, but they had something today computers are mostly missing, this is front panel. And if you have a look at the IMSI outside, it could completely work just with the IMSI, with the CPU board and some memory and do everything else here with the front panel. Here, here are the preset uh, keys or, or controls, and those are those which are controlling the, the flow of the, of, the, of the processor, for example, starting programs or something like this. And another technology was very important. Uh, like the scale be introduced, um, you have, need to have some, some kind of bus system with slots you can put extension boards inside. So you get it more, more vers flexible or versatile and, of course, also more open because it was a kind of standard where you can say, okay, these are certain signals that are on each contact and this is defined if, if you want to to develop a board, you have to comply to the standard of that boost system so everything should work together. This was a theory. Yeah? Actually, at that time, you had to cope a lot about things that need, needed interpretation, <laughs> what was really meant with, with a certain signal. Uh, but what they did with this called S100 bus, bus S100, by the way, because it, it had for every slot one, exactly 100 contacts, uh, you could uh, already uh, develop boards for that. Um, well, okay, and, and a lot of boards fitted in much more than than, than, a, than a PC today. But this was extremely uh, important for the development. And the the simple thing, uh, the simple setup normally was an Intel 8080 CPU with with the main board, which provided the S100 bus. And via the bus, you could connect, for example, a serial card and a teletype, or a serial card and a uh, and uh, a terminal, and you had some RAM, and this was it. This was okay. You di didn't have to, to, to work with much more. And many, many people at that time were extremely happy if they had a working system which had exactly that. But you could also imagine to have some, something more advanced. And uh, this is one of the configurations that shows, okay, I already have some other more, uh, more capable CPU, like the Z80, with the same bus, but already with a video card, uh, where you could show some, some text on that outside with the keyboard you connect, normally also to the video card, and probably a, maybe a cap graphics card at that time, very, very rare uh, developments, and probably maybe also some sound card, which was a later development. So you had already a complete system in, 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 in a way we would configure it today. 
But what about software? Um, did we need an operating system at that time for running the computer? No, not really. You could just use, for example, the, the front panels uh, to program it and say, okay, I've put some, some code inside the, the, the memory, please simply work it out, run it, and then you don't need an operating system. You need an operating system if you need, want to create some kind of homogeneous or homogeneity across certain platforms. And uh, the operating system, and you, don't, you want, because you, and, and how are you doing it? You, you do some kind of abstraction of the hardware. Uh, so the hardware looks alike on, on every system, so you have the same call to do for any kind of console output or console input, for example, or especially important for, for accessing the floppy disk drive and to transfer the data from and to the floppy disk drive, you crazily depend on, on having some kind of homogeneous way in the, so that you don't have to address all the different solutions that were around the market and, and to test them and to make support for them and so on. So there was need for an operating system that, that is doing exactly that. And the name of the operating system that was m most common at the time was called CPM. CPM was done by Digital Research, in the name of the company. And uh, CPM stands for Control Program for micro Microprocessors, so it was directly addressed towards the use with an Intel 8080 or an Z80 at that time. It strictly was using only Intel 8080 code to make it compatible, you know, so it could run on any Intel 8080 or on any Z80 uh, processor. It looks very much like DOS, which is not a coincidence. Yeah. So, um, another kind of uh, software you could, of course, very, very um, popular at the time was, was using Microsoft Basic. Yeah. And it was distributed by paper tape, and they could easily copy it uh, because you could bring in the memory and write it out on a, ne on a, on a uh, on a, a new uh, paper tape and then have a copy of that. You can do that all, all day long, and so you have a, a couple of hundred uh, copies uh, of that. And this was what was actually happened because they all were delighted by, by BASIC because it was easier to program. And uh, Bill Gates was not amused. And there's a very, very famous uh, open letter he wrote at that time uh, which addressed this Praxis of simply copying his code without paying the fees. And he said, I'm investing all that, that work and effort and so on, and I, I need that money to do that and to pay my associates about that. And he was claim, claim, uh, heavily uh, complaining about uh, uh, this, this kind of, of things that they were doing. And this was probably one of the first times that the, the open source uh, way they did before became an, an question mark. Uh, so is open source still good for making money? And uh, we know today that it is, it is <laughs> because otherwise we wouldn't have Linux. Uh, so, but it, it is still, uh, it was a time when, when uh, one of the first uh, uh, problem came up or some complaint about uh, simply distributing the software. Uh, digital, res uh, digital equipment also did uh, some, some things around BASIC and uh, uh, just for fun they, they published a, a compendium of, of 101 computer games. Uh, uh, I think the most uh, probably implemented was Space War. Uh, you could get it on, on paper tape, but you could also simply, simply type it in if, if, you, if you liked having, having that, that book. I'm still looking for it for an affordable price because it was also some kind of milestone, because it was some kind of Bible uh, when, when programming your own uh, software that day. Okay, but I promised. We want also to, to talk a bit about the Dazzler. Again, you can see it in the exhibition outside, just after the session, just come over and, and show you how it works. And, uh, well, what was a Dazzler for? 
um, there was a company called Chromamco. And Chromamco was, of course, um, placed in, in the Silicon Valley. And it was a, a, a spin-off of, of the Stanford University because of, I think it was two or three guys from Stanford University came out and said, we want to do something completely crazy. And what they did was, um, it had not so much to do now with the other things I'm talking about, is they, they said, okay, if, if you're using hardware in some, some special way, you can create a digital camera completely useless at that time. You don't need a digital camera vote for you at the analog ones uh, to, to work with. And how they did it was, um, you know about dynamic ramps. And dynamic ramps are ramps which are charging small capacitors, which are arranged in an, in an array on a chip. And uh, the cap these capacitors are charged and they hold this charge for a certain time. And the, this RAM component, this RAM chip, is working in a way that the, the system is looking after a certain time if there is some, some remaining charge on, on the capacitors and does a refresh. So that the information that is stored in the capacitors is continuously available and could be uh, requested at, at every time. This is how a, a dynamic RAM is working, which was a very new thing at the time. And what they did is, they removed the cover of the chip. Every chip was covered because uh, one of the problems of the dynamic RAM was if, if there was light hitting on the surface of the chip, it lost eventually the charge. And uh, the more light you're putting on, the more often this kind of incident was happening. You guess what? They used it, removed the cap, projected a picture on that, and they found exactly what they expected. The more light hit a certain, a certain part of, of this matrix, the, the more often the charge was gone. And so they could make a relationship, because how often the charge is going by, by, by with, with the amount of light uh, that or the, the, uh, 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 the strength of the light that is hitting a certain uh, uh, RAM cell on, on, on the chip. And uh, they used it to read out that, to convert it into digital information, but they didn't have a display for using that digital information. Uh, by the way, here's a camera, very, very uh, uh, simple. You have, can have also a look inside. Here's the, the RAM chip, which has been misused a, as, a, as a sensor for, for the images, and some, some very, very simple logic uh, to, to provide uh, the signals in a di digital stream outside. And this is how it looked like. <laughs> it was a 32 by 32 matrix because it was a chip that had, had one, exactly one kilobit uh, of, of storage space. Well, um, Okay, they needed a display for that, so they created another board. The Gra Dazzler graphics board. This is how it looks like, as you can easily see, it's not just one board, it's two boards uh, that, that are required. Uh, the upper board is doing all the analog stuff and, and most uh, of, of these, these cycles that you need to create the, the proper sig signal on, on, a, on a composite uh, video screen. And uh, the other card is, is uh, mostly used to create uh, the required uh, um, frequencies uh, and, uh, and, and also to do all the direct memory access uh, because it was external memory that was already existing that were used for, for, for doing frame bufferings. So I already said it, it was a frame buffer based uh, approach naturally because you had a 32 by 32 raster display what, what you needed. So they, they created that and, and sold it in a pizza box like this. Uh, and they sold it either as kit for, for nearly half the price or as a fully tested and, and, and built version, which was a bit more expensive. 
And uh, this is one of the advertisements you see um, where it was uh, merchandised and uh, yeah, with this one of the, the applications uh, that you could use for. Uh, by the way, I have some of the original journals or magazines. This is one of the pictures that could be produced with a death lock. Or this is a popular electronics where the death lock was introduced in the first time. Yeah, you can also have a look inside that when you go to the exhibition uh, after that. Okay. Mm. Um, but there was also something li missing because it, it was quite near when you have frame buffer graphics, you also want to have some interaction with the user. And uh, what you needed was some kind of uh, access for joysticks and doing some sound. It, it was revolutionary at that time because you had very, very few means to produce sound and nothing you could buy. So they created another board, you can see also at the exhibition, <coughs> which uh, produced the signals or could digitalize signals for, from, from a joystick to uh, give that for, for, for the computer. And this is how the, the joysticks look like. The joysticks are the same type you have on remote controls uh, for, for model planes and so on, uh, which you can use for that. Okay, now back, I promised, I started with this, chaos on the 5th Avenue corner, 32nd Street. Why did that happen? Well, at the time uh, that the Dazzler was announced, in this magazine, there was the owner of the computer store in New York who read that article, and he said, I need it. And I think he was one of the first clients who, who ordered that Dazzler board, and he put it exactly like we have in the, in the exhibition in, in the IMSI computer. And what he did was, um, he positioned it in his store, of course, and he had a long, long uh, cable, uh, coax cable, coaxial cable, that reached to the front store of the, the front store window of the, uh, of the uh, models, model store, uh, the model um, yeah, store, and he started an application, a graphics application running over there. He went home, closed everything, went home, and then this was happened. Yeah. So there was a complete chaos on, on, on in this area because what he showed in, in, the, in the window of the store was something that was mesmerizing the people that went by. So everyone was stopping over there, the cars were stopping, the, the uh, people were stopping, they went, went around uh, and so on. So there needed to, of course the police came and the police tried to find out who is the owner of that store and tried to contact them and he was already asleep and they called him by phone and he was completely dazzled <laughs> and uh, he tried to contact, he immediately tried to contact the, the owner of the computer store and said, you have to stop that. Uh, uh, if not, you, 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 this was your last day here with, with your computer store. So he, he went over there, uh, removed the coaxial cable and everything was done. But what was it? What was so fascinating, creating that kind of, of impact in, in the Fifth Avenue? Well, it was a very, very simple thing. Ah, again, here, here's how it looks like. Here, Pulks hobby store. Yeah, this is exactly the, the area uh, where, where it happens. This is not a, a live photograph of the traffic jam. This is just the only, the only picture I found in, in the web for the Pollux uh, store. What they showed was simply this. And the application is called Kaleidoscope. And uh, it did exactly that. It looked like a kaleidoscope. But the thing that draw the the uh, attention from, from the people walking by is they used to see lots of, of TVs in, in, in the store windows, but they were all broadcasts. And they could not believe that a thing they saw, that this was a, would be some, some kind of test image of a broadcast, because it was, they've never seen something like this. Yeah? So they saw it, and I can show it also in the exhibition, and uh, it's really still mesmerizing today. If you have a look, and it's, it's had some some effect. Yeah, if, if you uh, have to to have another guy who's taking you away after that and takes care of you. Okay, 
Now, how would it be um, to have one? Okay, I saw one on eBay this year. Uh, I stopped at eight hundred dollars. I, I certainly regret that because it went over one thousand dollars away. Uh, I didn't want to have that, but I probably will regret that. But I found a community in in the internet who tried to create a replica and. They, they discussed about that in, in the year 2022, and I saw there was nothing happened in about one year, and I just contacted them and said, I'm very, very interested in that hardware. Could we create a replica again? And the, everyone was again immediately there, and they said, oh, that's great. We, we have to restart it, and we have to follow it, and we did it. So we have rebuilt the Tesla. Not much about what you can do, how to rebuild the replica. You, of course, can use some, some kind of emulator, like this one here yeah, with the, kaleid well, the kaleidoscope. Yeah, it's a kaleidoscope implementation over there. Um, you can use an emulator, of course, for, for using that and to, to play on your own around that, but you can also uh, do the real thing. And uh, this is what we did. Um, we did uh, the, the design a key cut to create the, the boards again and to let a PP, PCB manufacturer produce everything. And so uh, after a couple of bug fixes that, that we had to do, everything was, was running fine and we can now show it in a real MSI computer. So this is the first thing is that, you, that you need after that is, is uh, the already created um, PCBs. And uh, mm, you need some sometimes rare components that are hard to get to get everything running because we needed time, uh, uh, special components of the time to do everything, uh, special kinds of uh, capacitors or uh, uh, of things that get 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 your your processor alive, and uh, we, we needed all that to to, sp to bring it up, and this is how it looks like now, and. Uh, yeah, um, some impressions of the bug fixing. You have to you, use your logic analyzer to, to see what, what is what is going wrong, or to go on the analog parts uh, to see uh, why your, your your video is not not showing any anything any information about that. And uh, the result is, well, what you can see here. This is a picture of the exhibition just around the corner, and of course you are invited uh, to. Just follow me after the session, uh, after the, the 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 questions or the questions and answers, and uh, have a look about that. And you can see on the left side there are the displays. Here is the Lea Siegler terminal. Here is the IMSI computer, and uh, some mass storage, so I don't have to key in everything to start programs. Here is the emulator running, uh, um, which is using the IMSA, but this has nothing to do completely disconnected with the, the rest of the of the exhibition. And here are a couple of S100 boards for everything. Yeah? There are sound boards, uh, there are uh, the digitizers, there are uh, GPIB uh, interface board, and, and a lot of other things uh, you could just do with it. And just to sum it up, um, the main message for today is uh, one thing. The first uh, instance of the graphics board already was one of the best because it could do very, very interesting things. And it, it, it used several years after that, even when, when new graphics boards were created, to reach the same kind of visibility they had on the very first graphics board. And the second thing is, in the years 1975 until 1980, you had an exceptional situation uh, on a certain region in, in the US at the West Coast, uh, which were, from my point of view, very close to the optimum um, setup for creating innovation because it was open. Because you, has, uh, you had access to everything because everything was published. And you had the community of the four groups I showed before, which worked together in the Homebrew Computer Club. Also had a picture of that, it slipped for some, some reason. But all came together in one computer club in, 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 uh, in Palo Alto, where they met together in a regular um, case. And, and they brought, they shared everything which is other, and just shared especially ideas which is other, but also knowledge from, from, the, from the tech companies. And so they had the optimum um, ground uh, to, to garden uh, all those technology. 
And, well, I don't know whether it's easy to, to make that just by planning it. It happened. Yeah? So this is why the, the, uh, finally the, the Silicon Valley got so successful. And probably um, if, if that would not have been the case, digitalization like we see it today probably would look a bit different. Yeah? Because this was, was the preparation for computers for the masses. And after that came all that, those uh, Tandy computers and CBM computers and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, of course, Apple computers and so on. But it was extremely important the years from 1975 to 1980 to make all that proof of concepts and create all those things. But the users actually, they, they all were, in, in a certain sense, electronic engineers because they noted they needed to, to be capable of soldering. They needed to be capable of uh, bug fixing and finding what is not, not functioning in that area. So there was the right mesh, the right soup um, that was required to create what, what we today have. Uh, and at that time, most people, if not, if not all people, said computers have no sense and no value for everybody. So for all the iPhone users, all the Android users, this is how it all went for you. And with this, I'm finished and uh, I'm open for your questions. And thank you very much. Vielen Dank. This, by the way, this is uh, exhibition number 13, Ausstellung Nummer 13. When, if you like to see it, and now I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.